More good news today in the crypto world as we see what can happen when a crypto exchange follows the right path and actually makes some slight modifications to keep themselves profitable. And when I talk about this, we're talking about Coinbase and the earnings report that just came out recently. And when we're going over this story, start to think about all the different crypto exchanges and platforms that have collapsed because they just couldn't keep up, they did the wrong things, or just something just fell apart for whatever reason, whether that be a scam or a Ponzi scheme or just poor decisions. Let's take a look at how things are actually done. So there was a report came out to, today, earnings call, and Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, says, uh, despite the crypto bear market with the lowest volatility we've seen in years, Coinbase is financially healthy. And I wonder, like, how do they do that? Why do they do that? Well, of course, they want to be healthy. But, but how did this actually come about? And it really comes down to uh, this report. Coinbase's diversified revenue model is paying off. So again, remember all the different types of exchanges and platforms that we had. And just compare this to what they did here. So here's what we got. While analysts anticipated a bloodbath for the quarterly earnings for Coinbase, it actually shattered expectations thanks to a change in revenue strategy. Subscriptions and services contributed 51% of their revenue. And before we go on, what they're really talking about is, uh, as far as subscriptions, is Coinbase One. Now, I use Coinbase One personally. I do not have an affiliate link for it. I'm sure you can find it, coinbase.com. I'll link in the description. But really what it comes down to is this. I know people will say, ah, but Rob, but the fees and everything else. But look, Coinbase One, I pay, it's like $19 a month because I pay for the full year. And it waives the transaction fees and also the sending fees uh, up to $10,000. So it works out pretty well for me because I dollar cost average uh, every single day for different various cryptos. So I don't know what your plan is, but this is what it is. Now, there's different tiers and all those things. I'm not here to talk about you know how it works and, and how great it is. But for me, I use it and it works out pretty well so far. And I can see what the allure of it is and why they became profitable. So... Uh, the statement here is the best way of having a successful business that has predictable revenue growth is something that isn't transaction based. Think about that. Think about all the different exchanges that are out there. And, and even if they're actually afloat right now, how many are at risk of becoming underwater? Competing transaction fee models often develop into a race to zero. And transaction volume is highly cyclical in nature. As the crypto market ebbs and flows, what seems to be every three or four years, transaction revenue is going to ebb and flow with that. It's a novel approach, isn't it? Think about the products that are out there and how they are at the whims and the beckoning of the four-year cycle because there's always going to be ebbs and flows. There's going to be bear markets and bull markets and busts. Wouldn't it be great if there was a project out there that didn't have to deal with the four-year cycles as things are going on? This is why I believe blockchain gaming is going to be so huge coming into the next bull run. But that's a story for another 10 videos coming up. So to finish up, revenues that stem from staking have been surprisingly positive. The new target of how much ETH is going to be staked is higher than basically anybody has predicted. Withdrawal Q of Ethereum has been effectively zero for the last two months. And the Q to become a validator has been 60 to 80,000 waiting. I didn't know there was that many validators waiting. That's crazy, which is about a month of time. I wouldn't be surprised if we end of the year at 30 to 40 million ETH staked. And of course, this is on top of their, the layer two chain they're using, which is base, which is built on optimism, getting a lot of attention. Now many people fully understand the ramifications of having a blockchain that you can own and get revenues from. Well, I do, because if you're doing transactions, you got to charge them something. And as time goes on, it's going to be a pretty profitable business for Coinbase. And then before you ask, no, uh, there is no base token, but you can't get into optimism. You can check that out. I'm sure there's a lot of videos on it. I just haven't covered it just quite yet. So that's what is going on. That's the positive aspect. And that's good. That's great for Coinbase. Now let's take a look at the flip side of some of the problems that can come in. And what I like about talking about Coinbase essentially is that this, when exchanges can prove that they can actually follow an economic model and be profitable without scamming the living tar out of everybody, I think it's a pretty good direction that we're going as far as the Bitcoin, crypto, and digital asset space. And hopefully this can lead us into the next bull market. Again, pay attention to those who are building and thriving in the bear because they will crush it in the bull. But here's the flip side of this. 36% of Coinbase second quarter net revenue is at risk going forward. Here's what we got. You got to remember this, this phrase. 
EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So it's earnings before everything else gets taken out, essentially like that. So Coinbase has improved its EBITDA from 124 million loss in the fourth quarter of 2022 to a gain of 284 million in the first three months of 2023. Though that number dropped 32% to 195 million. Again, pretty great. Q4 last year, weren't doing so hot. Now all of a sudden, they're in the black. That's what we wanna see. However, Owen Lau, Executive Director at Oppenheimer, predicted last month that Coinbase's adjusted EBITDA could fall by 90% to 29 million. Now that was his prediction last month. And we know how analysts, they love to analyze, and sometimes they're wrong. And he states, look, it was a better than feared quarter, he said Friday, which is a pretty funny statement. He's like, eh, I thought you guys were gonna be like yeah, in the dumpsters, but looks like you're profitable, whoopsie. And to finish up, this is what's tenuous. These are the things that they're saying is potentially could worry about. Interest income from USDC, stable coin and staking revenues amounted to 151 million and 87 million respectively. That represents 36% of Coinbase's net revenue for the quarter because they're getting interest off that by holding USDC. USDC's market cap has continued to fall while staking has been targeted by both the Securities and Exchange Commission and 10 US states. So that is another thing that uh, kind of bothers me. Uh, we have these rules. You see them right down below me, right? It's all gone. Don't invest more than you can afford to lose. Everything's a scam until you're otherwise. And number three is don't leave your crypto on exchanges. Apparently, this is falling on deaf ears because people are like, whatever, and they're leaving on exchanges. And what are they doing with that crypto? Well, they're staking it for you. And of course, you're gaining a little bit of yield. But remember, uh, there's this company. It was called FCX, also Celsius, also Voyager, also BlockFi. You left it there and look what happened. So just be aware of that's what's going on. It's good for the bottom line for Coinbase, but not so good maybe for you as an individual investor. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm not a financial advisor, definitely not your dad. So have at it. So there's other good news for Coinbase. And that is, I didn't know this, but Coinbase officially launches uh, in Canada. I guess that's happening today. So congratulations, all Canadian. You look like you're going to get a little bit of Coinbase. And uh, if you're looking, like again, try to that Coinbase one. You, I guess you get a 30 day trial offer. So good job for that. That was brought to you by Meg BZK. You can follow her on YouTube. A lot of good uh, information and advice. And uh, well, not advice, I should say, information. Or you can follow her on Twitter. I'll link it in the description below. Lastly, the fight between Coinbase and the SEC. Now we've covered this extensively by these legal briefs that have come to light. We covered this uh, yesterday in our live stream. You can also find uh, our Q&A in the live section. And we also talked about it three days ago. Same type of thing. I just want to say that I know that the, the SEC seems like a juggernaut, but after they got hit in the mouth uh, with that loss by Ripple, I think uh, the cracks are starting to show. So here's what we got. On Friday, legal scholars, venture capitalists, and blockchain advocates each filed amicus briefs. This is where they can submit legal briefs uh, to the court to talk about where they believe uh, that this uh, case is going to and just give perspective and expertise as far as uh, securities laws. And they join existing calls to bolster Coinbase ongoing defense. Several amicus briefs have already been filed this year, including from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which accused the regulator, SEC, of causing substantial economic harm to both Coinbase and broader business community. And that would lead me to a, just a quick question. If you feel like the SEC has essentially protected, protected you a little bit too hard, put in the comment section below, tell me just exactly how much of their protecting that they're protecting you, the consumer, and what had actually happened to you in your portfolio. Curious to see how that works out, especially what people say. And then legal experts argue that the SEC interpretation is too broad and could encompass a wide range of assets that are not currently considered securities, including commodities, collectibles, as well as traditional stock and bonds. And of course, a couple of videos we did yesterday and two, three days before, top US law scholars have already uh, submitted their, their briefs. Those are from Yale, Chicago, UCLA, Fordham, Boston, Widener, basically saying that uh, the SEC is out of line and the things that they are doing is incorrect. They argue that for an arrangement to be an investment contract, one of the three prongs of the Howey test, there must be an expectation of profit or a stake in the business's income, profits, or assets. Previous court ruling decisions emphasize the investor must be promised an ongoing interest in the enterprise's future profits or assets. 
I don't know about you, but I never got prof pro promised anything from Ripple. So we'll see how that works out. Jenner and Block attorneys filed a brief on behalf of U.S. Senator Cynthia Loomis. That's, she's a Republican from Wyoming, or Loomis, I should say. The senator contends the SEC's pursuit against Coinbase violates the Constitution's separation of power and hampers congressional attempts to oversee crypto. So that right there, my friends, I think is very positive news, especially moving forward. I don't think we're going to really take off to a massive, massive bull run that we should be if there isn't a bit of regulatory clarity. And I think we're going to get it, and it's going to come at the defeat of the SEC. And another side piece on this one, this is from uh, Dan Gambardello. He is the uh, owner and host over at Crypto Capital Venture. Uh, there is a YouTube site, I'll link in the description. And he said, uh, and this is for the other, uh, other case, he says, I love of Judge Fela, who is presiding over the SEC versus Coinbase case, is secretly on X reading the, the, this post by Meta Lawman. And Meta Lawman, he's a Vanderbilt Law, he's an attorney. He's got a pretty good point here. I thought I'd, I'd just uh, talk about it because we're just to get a little bit about securities. And he states, what's an investment contract? If I buy a share of Dallas Mavericks from Cuban, that's a securities transaction. But if I buy season tickets, because it has utility, tickets has utility, you can do things with them. You can go into the game and get it. You can resell them. Tickets to the Mavs game with the expectation of making a profit from reselling those tickets on the secondary market, that's not an investment contract. This is true, even though my money goes directly to the Mavericks enterprise, or Ripple, if you want to take that little uh, dichotomy there. The Mavericks owe me contractual duties to play the games and have my seats available. The profitability of my investment in the tickets depends solely on the efforts of others, namely Cuban, the players and coaches, and the supply-demand dynamics of the secondary market. As the amicus brief of the six security scholars in the Coinbase case makes clear, I do not enter into an agreement contract or an investment contract when I invest in those season tickets because I do not gain contractual rights to the income, profits, or assets of the Mavericks as it is the corporation, the team, the business. And I just wanted to point this out because I think it's important to get the best information you possibly can from people who are experts in their field. Now look, on this channel, I'm just guessing. I'm just, I'm just reporting the news and giving to you as best as I possibly can. But I will say that there's sometimes when people kind of, they'll give an opinion and it's just their opinion, but people take it as gospel. I think that's a big problem. And one of those people is Michael Saylor. And Michael Saylor has repeatedly said this over and over again about how Ethereum is a security, how XRP is a security, how pretty much all altcoins are security. And when I looked at him like, I don't know if that's true, I don't know if Michael's a lawyer specializing in security law, but I do know that he's a Bitcoin maximalist. And I am thankful for everything he's done for Bitcoin. The man, he has done us no favors in the altcoin department. And that's just how where I stand. Anyhow, let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And let's finish up with a shout out to Staking Rewards. On Sunday, every single week, I always take my crypto that I've been buying or dollar cost averaging on Coinbase and I take it for the week and I stick it in my Nano Ledger. And I noticed that I had not been staking my Solana, which I have been dollar cost averaging lately. And I thought to myself, well, how the heck should I do that? Now, before anybody asks, no, they didn't pay me. They didn't send me anything. But there's some great advice over here for staking rewards on how to actually stake and the best way to do it. So stakingrewards.com, all you gotta do is just, and first of all, I saw this, I'm like, wow, 7% for the rewards. I am really missing out. So I went over there, stakingrewards.com. You click on Solana, and then you come down here. And I was like, well, how do I actually stake it? And it says right here, how to stake Solana. And it'll tell you that the best thing to do is use a Ledger Harbor Wallet. I'm like, oh, I got one of those. It's in my hand right now. And it went, took, took me through all the steps, staking a firm, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, very super simple to do. So if you're looking for some way that you have your crypto and you think to yourself, maybe I should stake that, maybe I should do something with it. There's a great resource at stakingrewards.com. And that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. Things are going to come fast and furious like I talk about because of the Bitcoin halving coming up in April 2024. So get your information from somebody that you trust. That's it for today. Thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate you and I'll see you on the next one.